Hello, everybody. We are the Sustained Exploration and Habitation of the Moon team. This is the CHEESE mission, which stands for Civilization, Habitation, Evaluation, Experimentation, Space Exploration. And our goal is the establishment of a sustainable lunar habitat. To achieve this goal, we separated into five distinct roles where we each research different aspects that we would need to achieve and different research that would need to be done to have a successful lunar habitat. In terms of exploration, the moon is the most explored known Earth object. This has been through the six Apollo missions, landing a human on the moon, as well as US and Russian missions that brought lunar regolith samples back to Earth. In addition, this is also, the moon has also been explored through satellite missions such as Challenger, Surveyor, and the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, the LCROSS mission of which confirmed the presence of water ice in the lunar south poles. The goal of our mission is to establish a permanent human base on the moon to create a habitat for five astronauts for six month long missions. The placement of our base will allow us to answer many scientific questions that Ethan will get into later, as well as act as a stepping stone for future exploration of the solar system. So the site of habitat development that we have chosen for our lunar habitat is located on the Munson Crater, which is on the South Pole. If we look to the images on the right, you can see where this landing site is located and um, in view from Earth and as well as a more zoomed in version of our landing site. The reason we have chosen the Munson Crater is first of all, because the landing site has a floor that has a slope of less than five degrees, which allows for a flatter area for us to land and build upon. Additionally, there's a nearby sunlit area for solar energy, which Eric will be delving into more later. It also contains Highlands Regolith, which is a thicker regolith material, which is useful for architecture. And additionally, we have landed nearby a PSR, aka a permanently shallowed region, which contains water ice for us to be able to use as a resource. The habitat architecture, um, starting on habitat architecture, we are going to build our habitat essentially in two steps. First, we are going to be bringing an inflatable structure from Earth, as you can see in the top right photo. This inflatable structure will essentially have an airlock and act as a scaffolding slash skeleton for the habitat as a whole. Second, we will build use 3D printing to build a regular concrete layer on top of the skeleton in order to protect from the lunar environment. Next, our habitat, our, our habitat will be split into three main modules, the living area, science modules, and greenhouse, which you can see in the bottom right sketch. Um, as you enter the airlock, the astronauts will be able to reach the science modules first, have the living area in a higher level, and then the greenhouse off to the side. To delve deeper into the regular concrete we'll be using as a layer for our habitat, we will be using a geopolymer concrete, which of which we will need about 4,500 meters cubed of. Most of this concrete will have in-situ resources such as lunar regolith and water. This water will likely be sourced from the nearby PSRs and if water is used, we will be um, using the diagram on the left in order to create our geopolymer concrete. So as you can see in the diagram, we have a water recycling cycle a water recycling cycle in which water is reused and additional water does not have to be put into the system. However, if we are unable to use water, we will be using an alternative in the form of urea from the water recycling system of life support. However, the only resource we do have to bring from Earth is the alkali activator, which is in the form of sodium hydroxide, of which we will need to bring about 1.8 million liters of. Finally, here's a breakdown of the timeline of how long it will take for preliminary testing on the habitat to begin and for us to have a sufficient and life support and habitat and for preliminary testing of the geopolymer concrete and inflatable structure. And then it'll take about three days for the preliminary mission with materials, 3D printers and polymer to launch and land on the moon. It will take about a hundred days for this inflatable habitat to land, inflate, and for, the, for, and for construction of the habitat to begin and complete. And then finally, about two months for sufficient life support systems to be ready for the astronauts to come. Okay, so the two main hazards that our lunar base faces from the lunar environment are radiation and temperature. In order to deal with radiation, a regolith layer will be layered on top of the base, as Allison mentioned in her previous slides. This protects against solar flares, galactic cosmic rays. However, it causes secondary radiation in the form of neutrons. Uh, this can be shielded from using a layer of hydrogenated boron nitride nanotubes, or BNNTs, 
underneath the regular layer, as shown in the image on the bottom right. Uh, this hydrogenated boron BNNTs, uh, they absorb the neutrons through the use of hydrogen and boron. The other hazard is temperature, uh, which ranges from negative 173 degrees Celsius to 127 degrees Celsius on the lunar surface. In order to combat this uh, temperature extreme, we will be utilizing multi-layer insulation, uh, like the ISS, using materials like mylar and kapton. Also, like the ISS, we will be using an active thermal control system, or ATCS, uh, which involves collecting heat, transferring heat throughout the base, and using the heat rejection subsystem to eject heat back into the lunar environment. Similar to the base shielding, we will also need to protect astronauts from temperature extremes and radiation. So the BNNTs can actually be woven into yarn that will be put into the astronaut's suit to provide sufficient radiation protection. And they will also be using uh, materials like mylar and kapton in order for temperature to be uh, regulated within the spacesuits. Um, rovers will also be used by the astronauts. The image on the top right is the lunar roving vehicle that was utilized during the Apollo era. Uh, this was relatively slow and also not pressurized, so the astronauts had to wear their suits on when they were uh, riding the vehicle. The image on the bottom right is a space exploration vehicle currently in development at NASA. This uh, is pressurized, so the astronauts don't have to wear their suits within, and they can do their activities without the suits on. And it also has temperature control systems as well as radiation shielding in order to protect our astronauts while on the lunar surface. Finally, another hazard that the astronauts will face is dust. Camila will talk more about why this is such a problem, but in order to mitigate the dust on the lunar surface, we will be using electrostatic showers. The way this works, as demonstrated in the figure on the right, is that electrostatic potential lines will be woven into the suit uh, as fibers, and then the electrostatic shower will, call the will cause the dust to be ejected out from the suit so that it doesn't get inside the base. This will all be done within the airlock so that dust does not get inside the atmosphere of the base. In terms of equipment protection, um, the uh, temperature on the extreme moon is obviously very extreme. So a low coefficient of thermal expansion will be needed for our materials to ensure that they do not expand and contract, causing them to become unusable. Materials like silicon and silicon carbide and silicon nitride are good candidates for this. Our total daily power consumption is approximately 1,180 kilowatts. The figure on the right shows how this is separated up into the four distinct roles. For life support, an example would be uh, powering the lighting systems to uh, grow plants and food sources. Architecture, powering the actual lights for the base and the infrastructure, which would be the actual construction of the base using 3D printing of the regolith. Uh, for lunar environment slash resources, we'll be powering something like the electrostatic showers, which I first mentioned. And for science objective sample storage, A solar panel array will be the main power source for the base. One solar panel equals approximately 250 watts of power daily. So the size of our solar array would need to be approximately 590 panels, which would be approximately 1,100 square meters. Uh, to get through the lunar nights, which are 14 days, uh, we will have an array of lithium ion solar batteries to help us get through the lunar nights. Uh, these can hold approximately 12 kilowatts of energy, which we'll have an array of those in the base to help get us through the lunar nights and to power us. Um, through and to power us through the lunar nights. We we'll use unified S-band for the main communication spectrum. The reason why I chose this is because it can get through the Earth's ionosphere um, easily with little to no trouble. Uh, the figure on the right shows the location of the communications booster. And then the figure on the left, um, we'll place the communications booster along the lunar surface, along the ridge of the crater. Uh, the figure on the left shows the actual elevation, which is the highest point uh, along the crater to show that it is the best place for a communications booster to get the strongest signal relay back to Earth. Okay, so the resource that we'll be mining on the moon is water ice for use in the base. Uh, so this will be utilized through a process called thermal mining, thermal mining demonstrated in the image on the bottom left. The way this works is uh, sunlight concentrators in the rim will send the sunlight to a secondary optic that's um, on top of a half dome catchment roof that's on top of the PSR. So these seven secondary optics spread out the heat and light um, to the PSR, which causes the sublimation of the water ice within the regolith in the PSR. This water vapor, which has come from the sublimation, will then be sent to cold traps um, that are connected to the catchment roof, where it will be redeposited back in ice and then sent to a processing facility where it'll be removed of all impurities, where, and then it will be sent to a base for use as water. Um, 
this is around this is going to use around 200 kilowatts for 1600 megatons but this is a well overestimate and it is within our with our within our power um, estimations right now um, we will also be using preliminary missions uh, first to install the sunlight concentrators uh, and we will also be using another one to check the water weight percentage um, of the PSR near our base. The reason that we need to do this is because current data, uh, as shown in the image in the bottom right, uh, measures the water equivalent hydrogen in a Munson crater. The problem with this is it shows around a 0.2 to 0.3% weight percentage, and we need a 4% weight percentage in order for this to be viable. Um, the data that we're using right now only measures hydrogen at the very surface of the lunar environment and doesn't actually go below. So another mission to check below that would be necessary. Uh, as Allison mentioned, we're gonna be using regolith to uh, layer um, a good ra radiation shielding layer on top of our base. This will be through a 3D printing robot uh, as shown in the image on the right. So this robot will excavate the regolith, process it into the geopolymer and also print it onto the base. And this will be close to the base for efficiency and to minimize the time needed to actually build the base. In terms of transporting the resources, uh, regolith will be transported and processed all by the robot. So there's no need of uh, external transport there. In terms of the water uh, ice, a solar powered uh, rover will be utilized from getting from the PSR to the base um, in order to get water to our base. We will be modeling our life support system based off ISS for its many strengths, one of which being the really high water recoveries of about 98%. There are two issues with the system, however, the first being the gas loss from the CO2 reduction and removal step circled in green. To combat this, we will be having gas exchange between the habitat and the greenhouses and letting photosynthesis transfer the CO2 back into oxygen gas. As a backup, we'll be using MOXIE, which is technology that is being tested on perseverance with great results in the bottom right. Um, this device changes CO2 into carbon monoxide and oxygen gas. The second issue is with waste management circled in blue, which brings us neatly to our next slide. Because we do not want to waste valuable space on a return trip or pollute the lunar surface, we will be using this technology called OSCAR, which burns our trash from the astronauts and the greenhouses. This trash is converted to ash and gas. The ash can be used as fertilizer in our greenhouses, and the greenhouses will be a system of aquaponics, a combination of fish and plants. This combination will provide the best uh, combination of nutrients since there has been a correlation between uh, the, the number of fish servings and, uh, and not losing bone mineral density, which is an issue that astronauts in low gravity face. Now, food is not the only thing that fish and plants are good for. A major issue that astronauts can face in confinement and isolation is mental health. In order to combat this, we will provide our astronauts with ample leisure time and the ability to garden, um, as well as uh, disrupting sleep cycles as little as possible through circadian rhythm lighting, blue in the morning and throughout the day, and red as they're falling asleep. Now, Adarsh mentioned earlier about dust mitigation. Why do we do this? Well, dust can be very sharp due to the nature of weathering of, on the moon. And these sharp, small fragmented particles seen on the left, if inhaled, can cause a lot of inflammation in the respiratory system and has even, seen, uh, has even been seen to cause a form of hay fever as an allergic reaction, which can be dangerous to our astronauts. In addition, if the dust it, it gets into gears or joints of our machines, it can cause compl complications and malfunctions, which can also be dangerous to our astronauts. So well, our landing site is near um, two important geographic features of the South Pole. Uh, one mentioned before by Allison, our presence to a PSR and, our pres and that our landing site is inside the South Pole Aiken Basin. You can see an image of what the South Pole Aiken Basin looks like in this image on the right. This is a topographic map depicting that the bluer areas are deeper areas and the red and warmer colors are the higher areas and you can get a feel for how large this basin really is. Now our two scientific objectives that we want to complete are 
the origin of water on the moon and the age of the South Pelican Basin. And we'll determine these by uh, two, se two sample return missions. Now, uh, back to the origin of water. What we will be doing is collecting surface and subsurface uh, water ice samples where we would be, where they would then be returned and then be analyzed using a secondary ion mass spectrometer to analyze its deuterium to hydrogen ratio. Using that ratio, you can plot it on a graph such as the one on the right, where you can determine uh, a DH ratio that is relatively higher, could be ones of asteroids or from the Oort cloud, and DH ratios that are lower could be ones of a protostar nebula or even some of the gas giants. You can determine whether or not it's endogenous, meaning it, the water is from an internal process, or whether or not it's exogenous, meaning it, the water is origins is of an outside uh, source. On to the next slide. You can, we can then analyze um, impact melts. These are rocks that were created as a product of the impact that created the South Pelican Basin. Those samples will then be returned where we would use a thermal ionization mass spectrometer, where you would then track the decay of strontium into rubidium. You would then graph it against strontium 87 to 86 to find the isochron, which is a line of where they meet. And then with, if the line, if it's a linear, that means the age is pretty accurate. You would then work backwards to where the time of, str of strontium to rubidium where rubidium is zero since the rock is new. You would go back and that is how far back the age of the South Pelican Basin impact was. Um, in short, we'll be establishing a sustainable habitat that would be suitable for a long-term habitation of five astronauts. It'll answer fundamental questions that are unique to the lunar South Pole, such as the age of the South Pelican Basin and the origin of water on the moon. We'll be utilizing new technology to exploit in situ resources, such as 3D printing our lunar base or using regolith as shielding and using and more practicing on exploitation of those resources. We'll continue operations and it'll facilitate deeper exploration in the solar system, such as um, more practicing of in situ resource utilization to higher levels. Okay, so my personal reflection was uh, that I enjoyed working with my mentors and my team a lot. And uh, every single time we would have a session, uh, whether it was the SC speaker series or just our general meetings, I would learn new information through our research and all the presentations that were given. Uh, my personal reflection was that throughout C's, I was able to meet some peers that had the same interest in STEM as I, and I also learned a lot of new exciting information through both the mentors and C speaker series. I loved all of the speaker series because of the, as my fellow teammates said earlier, the wide range of professions and just seeing how crazy the different sciences can be involved with uh, space exploration. I also loved, even though we're virtual, I felt really close to my team members this year. Um, and I just really enjoyed the camaraderie that we developed. I enjoyed listening to all the speakers and listening to my mentor speak, getting firsthand experience and firsthand lessons from people who have been in the industry is definitely a very much pro of this uh, internship. And also working with my team for the design process was one of the most enjoyable experiences I've ever had. Um, I really loved learning from all sources, um, my mentors and the NASA speakers. And my real favorite moment is when the team and I, uh, when we named our mission, that was really fun. Uh, thank you to our mentors, Dr. Cliff Klein and Jordan Murray Dudley, as well as everybody who organized the CEAS internships, such as Selena Miller, Stacey Hagwood, and Teresa Howard, as well as to all the speakers who gave us amazing presentations throughout the CEAS speaker series. And thank you for watching our presentation.
Thank you very much. Are there any questions?